Okay. There we go. Okay. All right. Um, I just want to say thank you again for all of you for coming out virtually, wherever you may be. And thank you also to my committee for all of your help and support as well. So the title of my prospectus is the effects of high intensity interval training and traditional moderate intensity continuous training on critical power and muscle blood flow. Now, before getting into critical power and why it's even worth caring about, um, we first need to start with VO2 max and why it's important. So VO2 max is the maximum volume of oxygen that a person can consume and utilize. And this is shown in this, sorry, the laser isn't showing up, there we go. So this is shown here in this graph from Burnley and Jones that you can see as power is increasing, which can also be seen as speed or just the general intensity of exercise. As that's increasing, your oxygen uptake or your volume of oxygen, your VO2, is going to also increase. You can ignore the two separate lines. They initially, they just show the same trend that as the intensity increases, your volume of oxygen you're consuming and utilizing is also going to increase. And VO2 max is also very indicative of exercise capacity and our endurance levels. And this means that an individual with a higher VO2 max score usually is more fit than an individual with a lower VO2 max score. This also typically means they can perform at higher intensities for longer periods of time and are generally healthier overall, have less risk of cardiovascular diseases and such as well. But the question comes into play when we see that two people with the same VO2 max can actually still have different exercise capacities, endurance levels, and even just perform differently. And so if VO2, if VO2 max is so well studied and such a, a common predictor of exercise performance, there seems to be this hole in it. If we've got two people with the same VO2 max, but they're performing differently, what is different about those two people? And this is kind of illustrated in this graph here that you can see along the horizontal axis is your peak VO2, which is also the same as VO2 max in this case. And so you can see along this line, if someone has a VO2 max of around 50, 55, there's still a huge variability here in their critical power. And so this graph gives it away, but this is where critical power comes into play. And critical power here is offering another factor to take into account with exercise performance and even overall health. So critical power is defined as the highest power output at which steady state conditions can be sustained. Or in other words, it's the highest power output that a person can sustain for prolonged periods of time, which is typically about 20 to 40 minutes. And so we can see that here in this graph with power along the bottom, so as power is increasing, and also with time along the vertical axis or the duration of the exercise. We start here with max power. The maximum power that anyone can achieve can't be sustained for very long. It's really only a very few seconds that it can be sustained. Um, and that can be tested with a simple 30 second sprint test, which is also called the Wingate test. And but then we see as the power is decreasing along this line, that we're able to start holding that intensity for a little bit longer. So we, we achieve that VO2 max, which is, again is that maximum volume of oxygen that we're able to consume and utilize. And if we go down a little bit further, we end up at this critical power threshold. And again, it's that power that you can sustain for about 20 to 40 minutes. And so you can see it connects right around there, around that 40 minute mark that we can hold that power for. But we see that as we go just below critical power, we can start holding it 
for that intensity for much longer. As you can see, it, it starts climbing much more. Now, W prime here is considered the cofactor of critical, of critical power. It's the amount of work that the same individual is able to perform above their own critical power. So again, VO2 max, critical power, and W prime, they're all personalized measurements. Not everybody has the same amount of all of these, which is why we have such varying exercise performance abilities. And again, this is shown here in this graph um, with, it's just in a different format. So now we have time along the horizontal axis and power or speed along the vertical axis. And you can see that as time is going on, we can only sustain lower and lower and lower powers until we get down to this asymptote that is what's considered to be our critical power. So now that we know what critical power is, we need to also know what influences it. And so because we know that critical power is so heavily reliant on those steady state conditions in our body, we know that it has to rely heavily on aerobic metabolism so that we can be able to synthesize or produce the amount of ATP or energy that our body needs to meet the demand of the exercise. However, that production of energy or ATP is influenced by several factors, which are illustrated in this figure here. And it starts from everything, even just at the beginning of the amount of oxygen that we're able to inhale and bring into our body. That's going to influence it. Even the amount of oxygen that then diffuses from our lungs into our blood and the amount of oxygen-rich blood that our heart is able to pump throughout our body. And then we get down into the arteries and the arteries ability to deliver that oxygen rich blood to the active muscles. And once the blood is at the muscles, the ability of the oxygen to diffuse across those capillary beds from the blood into the muscle. And, that, and yet even once in the muscle, that oxygen still has to get into the mitochondria. So there's several factors that can influence this, and my project is focusing here on these, the skeletal muscle, cir blood circulation, and also the arteries ability to deliver that, the blood and the oxygen to those muscles. So seeing now what critical power is and its influence on performance and what influences it, we wanted to look into how do you improve it? If critical power is this little niche in VO2 max, how do we also improve critical power through exercise training? And as I got into the research, I found that there's actually not a lot of studies that have looked into this, that have looked into the training effects on critical power. And so I've pulled just the three most relevant to my study to talk about today. The first is this study from Gazer et al. It was done in 1988. And they actually did directly look at two different exercise training programs and how they affected critical power after six weeks of training. And so they looked at these two programs, a HIT program and a MICT program. The HIT program is referring to that high intensity interval training. And the MICT program is referring to the moderate intensity continuous training. So in this program, instead of doing these really high intensity intervals, so going to a high intensity and low and back and forth, the moderate intensity means that they're going to maintain the same intensity for the duration of their workout. So for their specific two programs they used, for their MICT program, they had subjects performing the exercise for 40 minutes at 50% of their VO2 peak, or again, their VO2 max can be interchangeable at this point. And their HIT program was 10 sets of intervals that were two minutes long each. And each interval was done at 100% of their VO2 peak. Excuse me. Um, and they, this, in this subject, they used 14 males. And yet, 
their subjects weren't all matched at the beginning of their study. And so that's one of the weaknesses in this study that although none of their subjects were trained cyclists at the beginning of their study, they, some were active runners. And so these varying activity levels in their subjects could technically influence some of their results. Nevertheless, after the six weeks of training, they found that both of these groups actually increased their critical power with a 13.4% increase in critical power from the mixed group, from that moderate intensity group, and then a 15% increase in critical power in that high intensity interval group. So here we start to see that, that critical power can be trained. We can improve it to help improve our exercise performance as well. And yet they didn't go into the why. They didn't look into what was causing or influencing that change in critical power. And so they didn't measure any of those blood flow responses or the vascular function that we're proposing to look into as well. So that leads us into the next study that was done by Helgrud et al. And a little bit more recently in 2007. And they actually looked at four different training groups. They had two that were more moderate along that MICT program, and then two that were high intensity intervals. So for their two MICT programs, their moderate intensities, are those LS and LT. It's just referring to a long slow, which again is just a moderate intensity for a longer for the long duration and lactate threshold, which was again, just a different moderate intensity holding that for the duration of their workout. For the two high intensity interval groups, they had these 15 seconds on and 15 seconds off group, and the four minutes on and four minutes off group. And both of these high intensity groups were working about 90 to 95% of their heart rate max during their training. And so within this study, they trained their subjects for eight weeks. They used 40 male subjects that were also healthy and moderately trained. And this study was also looking at running instead of cycling, which is what we'll be doing. And yet even after their eight weeks of training, they found these increases in stroke volume. Now stroke volume is just referring to the amount of blood that's pumped out with every heartbeat. And so we can see that after the eight weeks of training, these two high intensity interval groups saw drastic changes in their stroke volume, about an eight to 10% change in their stroke volume. And they also found that these two groups also had significant changes in their VO2 max. So, they, so that maximum volume of oxygen they were able to consume it was about a six to 8% increase in both of those. Whereas these two moderate intensity groups, they didn't see any significant changes. And so this study starts to answer that question about the why, what's influencing VO2 max or critical power behind the scenes, but they didn't actually measure critical power. So they didn't look into that specific factor. And this study is also really helpful for our purposes because this four by four hit protocol that they used is the protocol that we've derived our hit protocol from. That's where that comes from. The last study that I want to talk about was from Jenkins et al. in 1992. And they again looked at the endurance training effects on critical power after eight weeks of training. And they used 12 male subjects that were all active but untrained in cycling. And they compared them against a control group who they were just told to not exercise um, in a planned manner and to not perform any strenuous exercise for the duration of the eight week study. And the training for their study was a little bit vague in how they worded it. They just said it was at the mean intense exercise intensity that the individual maintained during a 40 minute test at their own critical power. So essentially to simplify that down, their training intensity was set somewhere around their critical power. And they trained for three times a week for eight weeks. Now this study saw 
huge increases in critical power in just eight weeks. They saw on average a 31% increase in critical power and yet they didn't see a significant change in their W prime. So again, that means that their the power that the individual is able to maintain for that 20 to 40 minutes, that increased, but the amount of work that they could do above that power did not significantly change. They also saw that VO2 max increased 8.5%. And this illustrates for us that, again, VO2 max doesn't cover everything. They only saw a small increase of 8.5% in VO2 max, and yet they saw a 31% increase in critical power. And this goes along with some of the subjective data that you'll hear some people say after a training program that they, their VO2 max didn't go up very much, but they say, I feel so much better. I feel like I can maintain this workout longer or I don't get as tired during it. This study would suggest that it, it potentially is their critical power that's increasing rather than their VO2 max. And so they can still gain a large number of benefits from their critical power increasing, even if that VO2 max isn't increasing as much. Now, however, again, this study looked into critical power, but it didn't look into the why. Why was critical power going up? So they didn't measure anything with blood flow or vascular function to answer that question. So with those studies in mind and seeing just how influential critical power is in exercise performance and how it's correlated with VO2 max, but it's its own thing, we developed these three main research questions that we want to answer with my project. The first question is, does a HIT program, does that high intensity interval training program produce greater improvements in critical power and W prime than a moderate intensity continuous training program? The second question being, does a HIT program produce greater improvements in vascular function than a MICT program? And the third question being, do such improvements in critical power correlate with the improvements that are seen in vascular function. Now to answer this, I wanna go into our methods and explain how we plan to answer these questions. And to begin, I'll start with our subjects. We wanna start with about 12 subjects in our HIT group and in our MICT group so that we can have a good comparison across both groups. We are hoping to get equal amounts of males and females in both of those groups as well. And a difference from our study to a lot of those other studies is we, all of our subjects are going to be untrained. And when we say untrained, we're referring to them not running or biking or rowing on their own about a mile a week. So they're pretty sedentary, they have pretty low physical activity levels. And this will allow us to see the greatest benefit of these two programs. Now, both programs though will train, have three training sessions a week for eight total weeks. And all of the tests and the, ex the supervised exercise training that they'll do will be done on stationary bikes in our lab. And now I've split up those three research questions we had by the specific methods that we plan to use to answer that question. So the first question being, does a HIT program produce those greater improvements in critical power than a MICT program? And so this, these diagrams help us understand how we calculate critical power. And it starts with having the subject perform three to five constant load tests on a bike to exhaustion. So this means that we put them on a bike at one intensity and they just hold that intensity for as long as they can. So for this specific subject, we had them do that at 160 watts and they lasted 291 seconds. And as it follows down the line, um, they, we also had them work at 140 seconds, 130, or excuse me, 140 watts, 130 watts and 200 watts. And again, these are the times that they lasted at that intensity. So we convert that into work in joules so that we can plot that against time on this graph. So you can see this first point is that 291 seconds. That was that first test. 
at 492 seconds was the second test and so on. And so when we plot this, we get this nice regression line. And the slope of this line is calculated out here. And that, that slope is considered to be their, this individual's critical power. So for this specific subject, their critical power was calculated to be about 112 watts. This means that this person could sustain 112 watts for approximately 20 to 40 minutes. And then their W prime is this Y intercept. So if this line were to continue here and intersect, this is what it would be calculated to be, almost 14,000 joules of work. And so this subject could perform almost 14,000 joules of work above their critical power before they fatigue and quit and are exhausted. So that's how we calculate it, but to ensure that we're calculating it accurately and also to make sure that we are running all of our subjects equally and we're encouraging them enough to, to power through when those, those tests aren't easy. So they need a lot of encouragement to keep going until they're truly exhausted. And so to ensure that everything's accurate and that these calculations are accurate, we're also calculating the standard error of the critical power and the W prime, which is just referring to how far away are each of these data points falling from essentially this line of best fit. And for this to be accurate, typically you want a, per, a standard error percent under 10%. And for this particular subject, you can see the data is very clean and very clear. Their error percents are 1.1 and 0.3, and even their R squared value is one exactly. So their, their line is perfectly linear, excuse me. And they, so we can take from this that the tests were done accurately, that the subject adequately performed or pushed themselves throughout each test so that they performed the same. And so now that you understand how we calculate critical power, to the other part of our first question is the difference between our two programs. And so these are our two programs. And before I get into them, I just want to clarify again that when an exercise program is typically prescribed for an individual, they're prescribed based off of the individual's heart rate max or their VO2 max. And yet this can be pretty hard to verify sometimes that this subject is actually accomplishing that percentage of their max during each training session. It also can make it a little more difficult to match the groups and to compare across them. And so we've converted it into a, this work rate max for the power output so that it, it makes it a little more convenient for us essentially. So with that in mind, our four by four hit protocol it uses these four high intensity intervals and they're each four minutes long and they're performed at 80% of the individual's work rate max. And that comes out to be about 90 to 95% of the individual's heart rate max, which is pretty typical for, these type, for this type of program when it's prescribed for an individual. This MICT program, they will hold 44% of their work rate max for the full 40 minutes. So again, rather than intervals, they're just going to hold that intensity the whole time. And that 44% comes out to be about 50% of their heart rate max, which is a little bit on the lower end of typical moderate intensity programs when they're prescribed, but it's still well within the standard care that's prescribed. And so we're still confident that it's a, it's a good program. Now the 20% intervals here for the warm up and this, these three rest intervals and the cool down of this program, that was simply calculated so that we could match these two programs for total work performed. And when I'm referring to matching these two protocols, I'm meaning that when we have two subjects with the same work rate max of, we'll say 300 watts, we want to put one of them in the HIT group and one of them in the MICT group. And by the end of each of their training sessions, they will perform the same amount of work 
they'll just do it two different ways. One will do it with high intensity intervals and one will do it by just maintaining a moderate intensity for the duration of their workout. So our hypothesis to answer this question is that the, this HIT program will improve critical power and W prime greater than this MICT program will, even when these two programs are matched for the total work performed. Now for our second question, looking at the HIT protocol against the MICT protocol and seeing which one improves vascular function better, we'll be using this PLM test, which is illustrated in this picture. So we will have a, a subject sitting here. Sorry, keep, my mouse keeps freezing. I will have the subject sitting in this chair nice and rested, completely rested before we start the test. And we'll use this Doppler ultrasound to look at their femoral artery so that we can measure blood velocity and the artery diameter, which will allow us to calculate blood flow in that artery. And so we'll do that while they're sitting there at rest. And then we'll have another researcher move the researcher, the subject's leg through 90 degrees of range of motion here. And as they start moving the leg, we'll continue recording to measure that, that blood response. And this, that's diagrammed here in this figure. So at baseline, meaning when they're sitting there at rest, we don't expect to see a change in blood flow because they're resting. However, once we start moving their leg, we should see this nice big peak in their blood flow response. And this peak of blood flow is also a good indicator of general vascular health and vascular function, so how well our arteries are functioning to meet the demand that's usually that's placed on them. And so our hypothesis with this is that the HIP program again will improve this, improve vascular function through this measurement of peak PLM blood flow more than the MICT program will. And for our third question, do improvements in critical power correlate with improvements in vascular function? I made this graph simply to illustrate our hypothesis. So we expect that the change in critical power and the change in vascular function will be significantly correlated and most likely in this positive linear relationship. And again, we are assuming this, expecting this, based off of the other studies that have been done looking at VO2 max and critical power, like the one I mentioned earlier, that they saw that increase in stroke volume. And so we're assuming that critical power and, and vascular function will be correlated since we've seen that relationship with VO2 max and we know that critical power is a part of your VO2 max. So this, a uh, diagram illustrates our entire protocol, our entire study into one nice diagram <laughs> and schematic. And so here you can see that we'll start out with four days of these pre-training tests. So we'll start out with that VO2 max test so that we can determine the individual's VO2 max, that maximum volume of oxygen that they can consume and utilize. This test will also help us determine their work rate max, so the maximum power that they can achieve and get to. Then we'll go into that PLM test, that passive leg movement test when we move the subject's leg for them and we measure blood flow. And then we'll go into these critical power tests. And again, as you can see, each test is done at a percentage of the work rate max that was determined from this VO2 max test. So we'll go through those critical power tests so we can calculate their critical power. Once that's done, we will partially randomize them into these two groups for our MICT program and our 4x4 HIT program. And by partially randomized, I mean that we will randomize them, but we'll also be matching them so that, it, again, if we have two subjects with the same work rate max, we want to make sure that we have one in both of the groups so that we can have that clear comparison across the two training protocols. Now after the four 
first four weeks of their training, we will do this mid-training checkup where we will redo that VO2 max test so that we can see if there's been any change in their VO2 max and their work rate max in four weeks of training. We'll also redo that PLM test to see if vascular function and blood flow responses have changed or adapted in just four weeks of training. And if their work rate max did increase during this max test, then that new work rate max will determine their, the intensity of their programs for the last four weeks. So instead of the program, that 80% or that 44% being based off of the original work rate max they got here, they'll, we'll now base it off of this mid-training test so that it continues to still be a, an equal amount of a workout. After those four weeks are done, so the all eight weeks of exercise training are completed, we'll just repeat the four days of tests that we did at the very beginning so that we can be able to compare from pre-training to post-training for both of these groups. And to analyze our results, we plan to use a two-way repeated measures ANOVA so that we can again compare that those pre-training and post-training values of critical power for both groups. We also want to compare the pre-training and post-training values of vascular function for both groups. And then we'll also use a Pearson correlation to examine any relationship between vascular function and critical power, as well as vascular function and VO2 max. And the alpha for those tests will be set to 0.05. Now, before I finish up, I just wanted to also provide a sneak peek into some of the pilot data that we've already started to see. So this is from, I believe it's eight subjects, four from our HIT protocol and four from our MICT protocol. And you can see from before they started training to after they completed the eight weeks of training, the HIT program in red has a tendency to increase critical power much greater than these MICT protocol subjects saw. The same tendency is shown here in the PLM peak blood flow, but again, the, the HIT protocol tends to increase it better or greater than the MICT protocol does. However, it's not quite as consistent as the critical power changes that we've seen so far. But again, this is only with a small amount of data that we've been able to gather thus far, but we hope to continue to see these types of trends as we continue recruiting more subjects. And with that, do you have any questions? So Jessica, nice, nice presentation. Um, I was wondering how closely does critical power relate to like a lactate or a, even a vent ventilatory threshold? So your question was how close does critical power relate to a lactate threshold? Yeah, or, or ventilatory threshold. Or ventilatory. Let me go back to this graph at the beginning. Um, so it's a little bit different for everybody, but it, critical power is typically above lactate threshold and below VO2 max. And the amount that it is between it, whether it's like exactly in the middle for a person, is a little bit just dependent on the person. So it's not terribly, it doesn't have a, a nice consistent relationship between that? Yeah, not necessarily, not that we've found thus far. And then, um, and what about mitochondrial or respiratory capacity, um, is that, better related to critical power, do you know, uh, versus VO2 max? That's a good question. And I haven't looked specifically into the mitochondrial capacity besides just the basic understanding from this figure that I know mitochondria is going to play a role because it has to create that ATP for us. Um, but I don't, I don't know anything more than that. Do you by chance, Dr. Gifford? Um, I would assume that it does, and uh, with all this critical power research, there's not a lot on it um, because it's burdensome to measure it. Uh, so 
the study that Chad that we're doing with the heating and the exercise training, we'll be able to look at that, the relationship between mitochondrial function, maybe excess capacity and critical power. Uh, and that'll be actually the first that I know of that's actually compared uh, muscle mitochondrial function versus critical power. Excellent, yeah, thank you. You all better start asking questions or I'm gonna start calling names. Jessica, this is Jason, I had a question. Um, yeah. On your intro graphs, when you're talking about W prime, I was wondering what the horizontal axis is on that graph right there. Is that with intensity or is that with time? For which graph? This one? The uh, one on the right. The one on the right. Yeah, so this graph, the horizontal axis is time. So as time goes on, the intensity or the power or speed that you're able to maintain decreases. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, Mom. Um, how are you selecting your participants, and are they going to be all within this a certain age range? Great question. Let me. Let's see. Can I? Okay, yes. So this, these are all of our exclusion criteria for our subjects. We'll be using all young adults that are 18 to 35 who are untrained. Like I explained that they'll, we don't want them running, biking, or rowing more than about a mile a week before we recruit them as subjects. And they'll all, we also want to make sure that they don't have any history of cardiovascular diseases or heart problems so that doesn't interfere with the data that we're getting. Um, also, no history of smoking. They don't, we don't want them currently taking any medications. Any females that are pregnant will also be excluded. And again, any they'll all be within that 18 to 35 range. And then this VO2 max is referring to when we run that VO2 max test, we'll also have a cutoff range. So for men, to make sure you're not too trained for us to use, if your VO2 max is greater than this 45 milliliters per kilogram per minute, then we'll exclude you. And then for women, if it's greater than that 40 milliliters per kilogram per minute, then we'll exclude you. Thank you. You're welcome. Jessica, if you just stay on that slide for a second. Oh, yeah. I'm just curious with females, do you coordinate any of their testing, specifically the blood flow testing around their menstrual cycle? We haven't done that in this study. We, I know in past studies in Dr. Gifford's lab, we have, but in starting the study, we realized that it was too hard to try to coordinate all of their menstrual cycles with starting the, the program. So we haven't controlled for that. So does that influence your, your blood flow measurements, do you think, because of the hormones? It typically can. And so that is a, a weakness of this, is that depending on what stage each female is in of their cycle, when we take that, do that PLM test to measure blood flow, that could, t that could influence our results a little bit. I'm wondering if you're planning on doing any uh, <clears throat> Uh, sex comparisons in any of these measurements at all? We will try if we can get enough subjects. We would definitely like to do that. It all just depends, again, if we can get enough males to female ratio so that we can make that comparison. In the coal study, we were seeing gender differences in blood flow. Um, isn't reported very often. Um, yeah. So I'm just curious if you're planning on that, but so what are you going to do if you get all males and two females? Um, we will we'll probably we'll two females or that. how do you do that? How are you going to figure that out? Do you include them or not if you don't get enough? If there could be some differences in females, but not enough to make the comparison, then, then what? 
yeah so we'll we'll try to get enough females and if not then we won't be able to make that comparison across the sexes you just assume that they're all the same and throw them into the pool is that what the plan is or i believe so dr gifford do you have a better way to explain i think you're still muted <laughs> We can't lip sync. Yeah. All right. So with the the, the male to female ratio, um, we're going to be able to get a balance of males and females within like one or two, right? We're not worried about that at all. So it's not like we'll end up with uh, mostly men and two women or anything like that. Um, we we're not designing the study to be statistically powered to make sex comparisons um because that would probably double uh the sample size required which uh would be very expensive to do so we'll use this as a preliminary study to examine sex differences um and then the issue with with measuring blood flow and the menstrual cycle typically we we measure blood flow during the first week of the menstrual cycle just to be consistent across people um that actually is, it's really hard to do that with a training study um, because you want the pre-measures and post-measures to be relatively the same time in the cycle if you're going to do that. And that's almost impossible to, to predict when a woman's going to have her next cycle. Uh, they typically don't follow a perfect four-week schedule like we're trying to fit in our study. So it's certainly a limitation uh, that might cloud the data, but we think the signal from the training will be stronger than the, the noise associated with the, with the menstrual cycle. Okay. And can you go to your slide that you showed the pilot data, Nicole or Jessica? The pilot data? Yeah. Yeah, that one. So in the left graph, the critical power graph, you see Obviously, some trends between the modern intensity group and the interval group. Uh, seems like a, you know maybe there's an outlier in that high intensity group that looks more like the modern intensity group. And the same thing in the PLM. Mm -hmm. You actually see one of the one person from the um, intensity group that uh, is decreasing. Right, this one. <clears throat> uh, so I'm wondering if you, if you have an explanation if this trend continues, you know, if this is the pattern in eight subjects, and you can see that for the rest of the subjects. <clears throat> How do you explain those? Um, I'm kind of assuming, you know, I don't, you have to tell me if the lowest red line in both of those graphs, if that's the same person or not. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if they're the same person. Yeah, I can't remember if they are. I think they might, um, but I can't guarantee it. Yeah, so if, if those four lines, kind of the order that they're going top to bottom, if that's the first, second, third, fourth person, if, if they're the same or <clears throat> clearly that bottom person is different than the other three, especially the top two, but mm -hmm. why would a person decrease in their uh, peak blood flow in a PLM after training? That's a good question. Um, the Again, like you said, it's not very typical that you would expect to see a decrease in that, that blood flow response. Um, so there could be a number of reasons that something, it could be up to their you know, change in weight or body mass may have influenced it. Um, if it was a female, I would assume that it could potentially influence if, where they were in their cycle don't know if it would necessarily influence that drastically to have such a steep decrease, um, but I'm not 
other than that, I'm not positive what would be causing that decrease decrease right now. Is it is it possible it's a bad measure? I mean, is it? I mean, could you is is it consistent enough where you would have criteria to say this actually was a faulty measure? Um, does that make sense? What I'm asking. Um, so I mean, referring it, to like when we're taking the measurement. Is it even logical that you would have a reduction in, in peak blood flow after training? I mean, is it physiological, physiologically re reasonable like to possible. see a reduction? I think it is. Um, I'm not the expert on that question. Dr. Gifford might have to comment in, but I, yeah, I think it is reasonable that it can decrease. It's just not typical. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that there's probably some variability in the measurement that's accounting for some of that decrease. Um, it's a weird. It's it's weird. It was unexpected. So we'll see if it keeps coming when we have uh, more subjects complete the study. Uh, one interesting thing with the the variability in responses that we've seen. So if you look at that hit group. You have some people that are having a big increase in critical power, VO2 max is the same, uh, or PLM. Uh, what we're seeing is that the, the further above their critical power their workout is, that four by four workout, uh, the, the more strenuous that is above their critical power, the greater the adaptations are so far. So even though they're doing the same percent of their VO2 max and work rate max, it's looking like with like the four or six people we have so far that how far above critical power you are actually influences your training adaptations. So they're not all working out of percentage of a critical power then? The same percentage of critical power? No, so the way we prescribed their programs, it was all based off of their work rate max and so that ended up being a different percentage of everybody's critical power because everybody also has a different critical power. But that is something that we found interesting and would think be, we think would be an interesting study to do in the future would to do a very similar study, but instead of prescribing the workout based off of their work rate max, which came from their VO2 max test, to prescribe it based off of a percentage of their critical power. That goes back, I think, to your very first slide. Two people with the same, yeah, so two people with the same maximal VO2 or maximal work rates could perform much differently at submaximal paces. Mm -hmm. um, so, what, what was the logic of um, basing it off? their max as opposed to their critical power to make sure everybody's doing the same thing because if even though they're, all, they're all exercising at the same, the same percentage of their max work rate, they're relatively speaking <coughs> in a different intensities compared to their critical power. Right. We So good question. We actually, when I was first trying to decide what to do for my project. I wanted to base it off of their critical power, but we felt like it, this study needed to be done first to justify doing that next study. So to start out with basing it off of a work rate max that's comparable to that heart rate max or VO2 max that other studies have used and measure critical power and understand where the training intensity is in, in relation to everybody's critical power. And then from there, we could create a study that was based off of their critical powers instead. So, so if you go back to your pilot data, Jessica. Mm -hmm. So that would explain some of this variation in these graphs there. Yeah. I think Dr. Gu Dr. Gifford explained that a little bit, that the, the amount of increase in their critical power 
could be due to that fact that those people were exercising much more above their critical power than some of these other people with the lower increases. Yeah, so I'm wondering if the right graph is a blue line that stayed constant, there's no change, and the red line that actually saw a decrease, and even though they're training, their overload just is not that great mm -hmm. compared to their critical power. You know, even though they're exercising, and you would think that just the fact that they're exercising, they'd see some improvement. But um, I'm curious if you looked at those two people, if you know what changes you saw, and maybe their VO2 max or max work rate, and it might maybe they had a smaller change in VO2 max, and maybe their actual overload wasn't what we we thought it was going to be. Yeah, I think that's definitely worth looking into to see what exactly could be influencing that. I'm wondering if there's a way to express um, this data or show these graphs um, somehow <clears throat> uh, illustrating their percentage of critical power, you know, a group of, you know, Maybe just to answer a question, I don't know if you, it's not part of your hypothesis or anything, but mm -hmm. intention of the study, but I think it might explain some things if you looked at these individuals, if there's clearly a group of people who are above their critical powers, some were right at their critical powers, some were below their critical power, and just look at these changes based on the relative intensity of their exercise. Mm -hmm. um, compared to their actual critical power. So. Yeah, I think we'll definitely look into that as we get more subjects in and as we do the analysis of all of them, we'll definitely compare that with what the relative intensity was to their critical power. My next question, Jessica, is normally when we talk about pilot data, um, Sometimes we in include that in our, uh, I guess by definition, I, I think of pilot data as something we do before we start our data collection just to make sure the methods are going correctly, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's the context that you're uh, describing this data here or, or if uh, this really isn't pilot data, it's just the first eight subjects. True. Um, it's so this data includes not the entire pilot data and not the entire data that we've collected for the study. So it a couple of the subjects were from in technical terms the pilot data that was done in the fall semester to work out the kinks of things to figure out the methods and then majority of this data though was from the subjects that completed during the winter semester since you all had allowed me to start collecting data prior to proposing um, this data is from those subjects that were able to complete it during the winter semester okay so <clears throat> looking at this data um, would you proceed as is, or would you change anything? I would believe that we can proceed as is and just continuing to ensure that we're doing things the same so that we can continue to see these trends and hopefully not have any more outliers like this, um, just to ensure that our that our methods are the same across all of our subjects. Um, it might be good to you know, take a look at those couple of subjects and those two on the right that are not seeing any change or actually decreasing, which is, I understand there's always some variability. Um, 
mm -hmm. the measurement or lots of factors can be contributing to that. Uh, depending on how you're expressing your data, taking into consideration, you know, leg circumference or composition of the leg or uh, sex or something else. But mm -hmm. um, interesting to see if you can have an explanation for those two people on the right that no change or decrease in blood flow and in the future, just make sure that you know have a plan of. If you see that trend again, what do you, you know? What are you going to do? Are you going to retest them? Or are you going to? There's something you can do to prevent that. I, depends on what's causing that. But. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that, we can we can definitely do that. The other thing I'm interested in, Jessica's um, in training studies is. So are these subjects here, this is the full eight weeks? Yes, they, these are subjects that completed the full eight weeks. Um, <clears throat> but you have four week data also, right? Yes, I just don't have it graphed out, but we yeah. do have that data from that mid training checkup point four weeks in. Yeah, so I'm just wondering what the timeline of these adaptations are. If most of the adaptations occurs in the first four weeks or in the second four weeks, or if it's kind of continuous, if it's, if it's the same. Mm -hmm. You know, because that shape of line might be different if you throw in there the four week data, you might see, well, most of, the, most of the change occurs in four weeks and then less change occurs in the second four weeks. I, I don't know, but it'll be interesting to, to see that. So you, sure. actually, you actually have a repeated measure, it's not just a pre and post. Uh, <clears throat> you have some kind of repeated measures, pre four weeks and eight weeks. Um, yeah, we, I know, I, like I said, I haven't graphed it out, but I know from just running the tests throughout the study for these subjects, I'm pretty sure it was more typical to see bigger improvements within those first four weeks. And, but it, then it kind of depended just on the subject. Sometimes some subjects did continue to increase in the last four weeks, some maintained, and I don't think we had any decrease in the four week, the last four weeks. But yeah, so we'll, that will be something that we'll be interested to see as well when we get more subjects to see just that timeline, like you said, of those improvements. Yeah. So your, your stats section, can you go to your stats page, please? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so you're comparing pre versus post training values. I'm wondering if uh, there's more value in uh, I don't want to say this, sub subtracting pre versus post. So you have a difference, you know, you have an Excel file, you have a, a column that's the difference between pre and post. And you're comparing the difference. First of all, you're comparing it from zero to see if there's a natural change or not. But then you're also comparing it between the groups to see if the, not necessarily the pre and post are different, but the change is different. I think that's really the question. Because um, they may have started and ended at different places and other confounding variables. But if you look at the change score, and then analyze the change between the groups. I think that would probably be a little more revealing. Okay. More accurate of this type of uh, data. So looking more at the changes instead of the absolute numbers. Yeah, because like pre pre training, they <clears throat> unless you're somehow accounting for everybody's starting at a slightly different place. Um, 
what you're really interested in is the change between uh, week zero and week eight. So you just subtract with each variable, you subtract the post screen or pre training score from the post training score, and you see a change. Mm -hmm. And then you compare that change to zero, simple t test to make sure that it's, it's actually different from zero, that's actually a significant change. And then you compare the change between the two groups. So the change in your Interval training group was different than the change in the moderate intensity group. Yeah, that'll come out in the in the ANOVA. Um, so you look at a main effect for time pre-post uh, for training intervention, and then really the interaction between the training and the the training group and the time is what we'll see if there's an improve greater improvement with one over the other. So that should all come out with the ANOVA, but we can try and plot it different ways. Are there any other members of the committee that would have any questions? I think we're getting close to the hour here. Mandy, Ty, throw you under the bus. My questions were, I think, all adequately answered. I had a question about how the intensities were determined and how that related to critical power. My, my thinking was if we want to increase critical power, if that's the goal, then we should be working out at critical power specificity type thing. But I think Dr. Veer's questions and the way Jessica answered them answered those questions. And so great job, Jessica. I thought you did a fantastic job. You really show a great understanding of, of what you're doing here and that's impressive. Thank you. All right, um, so with that, I'll, we can dismiss uh, anyone who's not on the, the graduate committee. Uh, go ahead and say, uh, your congratulations and everything. I, I think Jessica's done a pretty good job here. Um, so everyone give her a nice round of applause wherever you are in the country. Um, and uh, maybe you'll we'll just stick around and talk with Jessica, Jessica a little more to see if there's anything else she needs to do before she's done. Congrats, Jess. Great job. Thanks, James. Congrats. Good, good job. Rest. Congratulations. Good luck. Two. Bye. Bye. <laughs>